All right, folks, welcome, welcome. My name is Hunter Lewis. I am the editor-in-chief of Food & Wine. I am thrilled to be here. My first rodeo, my first Food & Wine Classic in Aspen. Um, I'm sure many of you, this is your 10th, your 12th, your 14th. Um, we are super excited to present Hugh Ashton today. Give it up for Hugh for a second, all right? So Hugh is a scholar. He's a gentleman. Um, he's, he's a pretty damn good cook, too. Um, <laughs> Hugh was a Food & Wine Best New Chef in 2002. Um, he has won James Beard Awards. He's a book author. Uh, many people don't know this, but if you follow him on Instagram, he's a really good doodler. I called him an illustrator. He said he doodles. Um, Hugh will be doing a book signing for his new book called The Chef and the Slow Cooker at 4.30 today. Uh, where's the book signing? Grand Tasting Pavilion, so if you have a slow cooker, which I think 98% of the Americans do, go get a book and cook some great slow cooked food. Um, all right, Chew will be doing many different kinds of shellfish today, and we are thrilled to present him. Take it away, sir. I've known Hunter for a very long time, and he is a great, great human, and food and wine is in great hands with him. Um, let's see, but that's the only nice thing I will ever say about him. Um, <laughs> so we're going to make some stuff. I'm, we're going to make three different things. We're going to make a sort of classic lobster roll. We're going to really nicely butter toast these buns. I'm going to show you how to cook lobster sous vide, which, you know, sous vide is a bit of a misnomer because it means under vacuum. Uh, this will actually not be in vacuum, but just submerged via uh, sort of uh, displacement method with a bag with raw lobster or barely cooked lobster inside to kind of stew with butter and tarragon and a little bit of salt and pepper. So we're going to do that first, and then we're going to make a oyster stew by fresh shucking these beautiful little oysters and use, making a stew with salsify, which is this ugly ass vegetable, which when you peel is this brilliant white and almost tastes like oysters and has a synergy with oysters that works really well. Um, the beautiful uh, allium family, this is the leek, so we're going to use a lot of that. Chopped parsley, some merkin. Merkin is a, a smoked chili powder from Chile. It also is a pubic wig. <laughs> I shit you not, the exact spelling, which is really weird in a recipe. Never go and buy a pubic wig. <laughs> I've got ground ginger and simple chili threads as well. Um, which brings up, why would you ever need a pubic wig? I don't know. I've got chicken stock, um, heavy cream, a little bit of creme fraiche, and garlic. And that's all going to go to a stew. And then we're going to take these beautiful little snow crab claws. And we're going to make um, really simple, spicy miso and Calabrian chilies kind of a messy, simple saute of crab in almost a Chinese style with fresh mint and basil and all that. But first, I think it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so you can avert your gaze if you don't like things dying in front of you, because I'm going to kill some lobsters. Um, I'm going to take one of their fancier knives. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Don't look at me. And we're just going to saw their head in half, break off their arms, and then rip off the tail. This was kind of like my trade demo this morning with Gabrielle Hamilton. Um, okay. I will say a lot of things that half of you will get, and the other ones were like, this guy's really weird. Okay, second small death of a crustacean. Rip again, repeat, rip, and body goes down there. There's a large body pile down there. Now we're going to straighten out these tails by taking skewers and skewering all the way through. And that's just to keep it uh, cooked in a sort of uh, straight manner where it's not going to all curl up and overcook. We're going to spot blanch these. Aw, he's still moving. <laughs> Wave at the crowd. Wave. <laughs> Wait. 
I am not here for your comic relief. <laughs> you are. We're going to immerse these in boiling water that has been lightly salted for one minute, and then we're going to put them in. Uh, we're going to get them out of the shell uh, in a sort of messy, fun fashion of juices of lobster going everywhere. And then we're going to put them in a plastic bag such as this with a copious amount of butter. We're going to cut it into the smaller pieces that we want at the size of our lobster roll, which means a size to fit in a human mouth. Um, and then we are going to make a dressing for the uh, lobster after it comes out of this. Um, Really, lobster, if you were doing it 100% in the boiling water, lobster tends to take about six minutes per pound in boiling water. My mother used to cook them for 55 minutes. Um, may she rest in peace, but she was a horrible cook. Um, but uh, in this case, it's going to sous vide uh, for a while because the, the the beauty of a sous vide cookery or an immersion circulator like this is this is a water bath. This, is a, uh, this has the ability to set to a precise temperature. And right now I've got a 129. Um, and so boiling point is 212. This is going to be a very mellow braise to cook this. So it can be a longer extended cooking time of about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Um, OK, so these are about to come out. And then we're going to shell them. And we're just going to wait just a little bit longer. In the meantime, I'm just going to start my butter toasting in a pan. It's not deep frying bread, it's butter toasting. But these are potato rolls. These are like King's Hawaiian classic, just simple potato rolls. They're the top cut ones. I like top cut for things like uh, potato ro uh, lobster rolls because then it's not as messy. And we want a lot in there, so we'll do that. And then I've got chives, I've got some mayonnaise, um, I've got black pepper, uh, it's fresh tarragon. So uh, tarragon from a tin, uh, dried herbs are silly unless it's like Mexican oregano um, and the occasional bay leaf and stuff like that. Try and get fresh stuff. I've got fresh celery, uh, shallot, and fresh lemon juice. I say certain things every year, but like if you buy a little plastic yellow lemon, you're dead to me. Um, <laughs> lemon juice comes from an actual lemon. If you buy pre-minced garlic, nope. Don't be talking to me. <laughs> so the butter's melting. The, the, the process of butter melting, you want, to, you want to get the pan up to temp, and it's going to melt properly. What you want it to do is bubble and froth, but not separate to the point where it's going to brown. Browning butter is the separation of the milk solids from the ghee, and the, the, what browns is the milk solids. So we don't want to get to that stage, but we're kind of on medium heat right now. And then we're going to get these in and just kind of press them into the butter and toast them off. Well, I'm just going to do two because I'm just really cooking for myself. You guys are just watching. Um, <laughs> this lobster, I'm going to get into this ice water so I can work with it. So it's coming out of its initial one minute sort of blanch. It's going to go into these, this ice water. I'm going to pull the skewers away. And we are going to get these tongs. All that's going in there. And then we're going to whack the hell out of it and get the meat out of the uh, Claws. Lobsters are a lot less expensive sometimes than people think. Everybody thinks it is this luxury item. We have an abundance of lobster, and it's actually a really sustainable fishery in the United States. Uh, just make sure you're buying, it's hard to buy non Canadian American lobsters when we talk about the main style lobster. Um, but these are beautiful. This one's probably about a pound and a quarter, pound and a half lobster. So I'm just going to cut for ease, I'm just going to cut the end of the tail off, and then I'm going to break using big poultry shears, just cut down the top away from the flesh and then kind of open it up. And what pops out is this. So that's a whole lobster tail. You can get that at uh, Outback Steakhouse for $45 extra. <laughs> Worth every penny. Um, okay, now we're going to take the claws and, yep, sorry about the front row. Uh, the trick to the claw is you crack it really well and then you're going to break this the smaller bottom thing, and pull that off. Now, there is a piece of this um, shell piece that goes through the claw meat and allows the claw to do this, um, which is technically called opening your claw. Um, so we're going to make sure that comes out. And it's just kind of a little uh, clear plate of claw. 
Well, that was messy. Okay, uh, now we're going to cut these and get all the meat out of the, uh, not the claw, but the arms. What would you call them, arms? Do they have arms? Appendages. And I've got a bunch already going, so I'm going to save some time by not doing this. There we go. So now what we're going to do is put this on our cutting board, slice it into manageable pieces that you'd like in a lobster roll. So I'm going to take this one I've already got done. It's just cooked for one minute. Going to get nice big medallions of lobster, just like that. Got my other one that I just cooked. And nice little medallions as well. And I've got some of this claw meat or the arm meat. And we don't want that. And then this is all going to go into this bag. So you can do this ahead of time and set your circulator up closer to when you want to cook or eat. I've got the butter going in. Where's salt? <laughs> oh, it's there. It's hiding. OK, so this is just regular kosher salt. And that's going to go in, and then this is going to be sealed. And this is how we submerge using, I'm going to put a couple of, a little bit of tarragon in there as well as it cooks a little flavor. Tarragon's kind of assertive, but I love the flavor with um, lobster. Okay, the way we submerge this is what you're looking to do is let the air go up into the top of the bag so it sinks. And then we're just going to seal it, and we're just going to tuck it off to the side here. And it's going to cook like that. So circulators used to be like $1,000. Now they're like $200, $300. So they're good ways of sort of extending your day. Holy shit. <laughs> so once you've got your first batch of buns in, then we're going go to go the second. The way you brown butter. I'm human. No, 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 my name is Hugh, man. Um, so, I'm going to toast these slightly. I'm going to watch them a little bit more closely. And uh, we're going to start making our dressing. So, we've got, I've got some of this lobster meat that I've already done in this process. This is what it looks like. It looks like melted butter and lobster. It looks like a heart attack, but a heart attack of pleasure. As Julia Child said, everything in moderation. Um, but you've got to live life. Okay, you guys are done. I'm going to put this off to the side. Somebody next door is like, what is Hugh doing? Okay, this can go over there. Now we're just going to begin to assemble. We've got our meat, and I'm just bringing it back up so it's slightly warm through. And I've got my buns. I'm going to put, basically we're taking mayonnaise, which you could make by, by hand, or you could make... Um, it, 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 like by Dukes, I live in the South, or you can buy Hellman's. Don't use Miracle Whip. That is gross. Um, I also, as much as I love Japanese food, I do not like QP mayonnaise. QP mayonnaise is very sweet. Okay, so I've got some uh, celery. I think celery's got a ton of flavor and a beautiful affinity to seafood. So and then I've got a bunch of chives. I've got some more tarragon. I've got some fresh shallot. I think shallot's a beautiful thing to use. I've got some lemon juice, which will thin down the um, mayonnaise a fair bit and just become a nice, simple dressing for the lobster to go into. Um, we've got the one batch of lobster. I'm just warming up. So I'm going to get that. I'm going to strain it lightly. or I'm going to take a spoon and spoon it out. But this, so the lobster is just this just beautifully cooked right now. It's totally tender. It's totally buttery, um, which is what you should get in a lobster roll. So you can do this ahead of time, too. You could cook the lobster completely and then just warm it through. So it shouldn't be as difficult as you think. Obviously, they just made you one lobster roll, but that's OK. Here we go. OK, we're going to mix this. And then we are going to serve it on our bun. And on a plate. Whoop, 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 whoop. I have a spoon tucked in. I have tools everywhere in my body. 
Okay, so we've got this, and we're going to open that up. And you know when you go for a lobster roll, and it's like $25, because that's what people charge for lobster rolls these days? And, you're, and then it comes out, and it's this little paltry little thing. You don't want that. You want to give people value for their money, and so you want a ton of lobster in there, all piled up in a sort of crazy thing. But, you know, a lobster roll is meant to be a mess, a good mess. So then I've got over the top, I'll do chives, and then we'll put them all around the rim like it's 1988. <laughs> Little chili powder. Uh, or we can plate in the modern way where you, you actually just leave the plate blank and you put it off to the <laughs> side. The only chef alphabetically in front of me is Grant Ackett's, so I feel very confident with that move. Um, okay, so that is a lobster roll. Very simple, very straightforward. Don't be scared of cooking lobster. You can, you can buy them, you can get a fishmonger to kill them if you feel a little queasy with that part, but as you saw, there's kind of this like, I have opposable thumbs type of thing going on. That is a good thing. Okay, we can remove this pan and this pot. I will need the pan back for later toasting though. Do you wanna remove these two? They're hot. Okay, now we're gonna make a oyster stew. Now this is a really kind of southern classic oyster stew. So where do people go wrong when they're making something like oyster stew is they overcook the oysters. So I'm gonna make a really flavorful soup base with the salsafia and the leek, and then I'm going to lightly poach the lobsters in the end result of the, of the last second. First step is I've got really good bacon that I've cubed up into just like kind of a third of an inch dice. And I'm gonna add, just to moisten the pan, I'm gonna add just a touch of olive oil. You could add Pernod or something to this too. Um, I like the flavors of anise with this sometimes. So we use fennel, we use Pernod, we use, um, you could use anise seed. Nigella seed works really well in this, which is like an onion seed. Um, and so that's gonna cook down. Then I'm gonna add my leeks. Then I'm gonna add my salsify. So let me show you how to prep salsify. Can you guys see what I'm doing? Do you wanna come over here? Uh -huh. So salsify looks like that on the interior. It, is, uh, it will oxidize very quickly, so you have to get it, once you're working in it, you peel it away. It's a beautiful root vegetable. You just don't commonly see it as much, except at fancy restaurants. And we're gonna peel it all away until just its white ivory looking color shows. And then you're gonna plunk it down into some acidulated water. So that means water with acid in it, which can be fresh lemon juice or a little dab of vinegar, and that'll prevent oxidation. Just like you'd be when you're prepping artichokes or something like that. It's artichoke season right now too. This with artichokes would be awesome. Okay, so we see I've got a bunch more peeled already. They're in acidulated water. So we're gonna process those and slice some of them down to go into our stew. So when we're cooking bacon, in this regard, it's gonna be in a soup. I'm not looking for it to be crisp, crisp, but I am looking for it to be abundant with flavor um, and lightly cooked. I don't want it to be raw and sort of gummy. Okay, so next I've got the salsify, which I'm gonna, I've already sliced the leeks. When you're slicing leeks, this is a leek. My hand is the ground. As the leek grows, it pushes up dirt. The dirt gets housed in here, like that. So the point at which the dirt starts is kind of where it is at the ground point. So at this point, the leek from here below is relatively clean. From here above, it's got dirt within each thing. So you slice it in half, rinse it in a number of cold water um, rinses and to dislodge any of the dirt and then process from there. Less flavor, more worthy of stocks. Good flavor, the best flavor. This is where you bark at people if they throw this bit away that they're stupid. Um, <laughs> do it nicely, it's, it's, a, it's a more empathetic world out there. Um, okay, so the bacon's going down. I've got the leeks going in. And those are gonna steam down just a little bit. Working on medium, medium high heat. We're gonna wilt all that down. 
The wonderful thing about alliums, like an onion, like a shallot, like a leek, is you're trying to transform what is innate sugar to be really amazing sugar. And that's through that Maillard reaction, that cooking, that slow stewing, really brings out the natural sugars in what you're cooking. So I've got the uh, sauce for you. I'm just going to run down. Who's next door? Alex Grinichelli? Oh, God. <laughs> My mom's a publisher. Editor. Mm -hmm. My restaurant's called Butter. Mm -hmm. uh, I really love her. Um, so we're going to do about a cup, a cup and a half of chopped uh, salsify. And just, I'm just cutting in a certain nice little quarter inch pieces. I want to see it still be able to discern what it is when it's in the bowl. And this is one of those almost chowder-like things, not brought together with flour or anything, though. So the, the salsify is going to go in. It's going to cook in the manner of a, like a potato would cook. So at this size, it's going to good, need a good 10 minutes. But we are well on time. We're kicking ass right now. Are you okay? I think this is like the 86th year I've done this festival. It's still great. We still love it. Okay, let's talk about flat leaf parsley. Curly parsley, it's got a very different flavor and it doesn't react very well on a cutting board. Um, it wants to fly everywhere. Uh, but flat leaf parsley, use the stems as well. This is just the leaves, but the stems could be used as well if you finely chop them. This I'm going to chop in sort of a more Italian style, which is like, ooh, whatever. Uh, whereas the French, the French are like, um, so the Italians are just like, eh, that looks fine. I'm going to go outside now. Um, and that'll be enough. And so we'll get to that in a little bit. I've got one tool in my pocket. Again, I have a lot of tools on me. This is really handy. It costs like 50 cents at a kitchen supply store. And it's great for scraping up cutting boards and scraping bowls and getting things off. And basically, it aids you in having a cleaner station. So I'm going to put this off to the side. And then I'm going to look at things I don't need, like this. I'm going to put them aside. I have my lemon. I don't need this. And I'm going to shuck some oysters. So shucking oysters. One of the greatest uh, cookbooks I think ever written in the modern age is uh, actually David uh, Chang's Momofuku cookbook. And one of the things he really takes the time to do is teach people how and why it's important to shuck oysters well. Because when you go in this day and age and spend $3.50 on an oyster that some guy has crushed half of the shell back into the oyster somehow and left you with this mangled little snotty thing, it doesn't feel like it's a pristine, beautiful thing. And oysters should be. So let me show you how. There is a top and a bottom to an oyster. There is inside what is called the abductor muscle. Then there is the actual oyster. The liquid inside is in inherently important to keep the oyster fresh. So oysters are, when they're out of water and tightly closed, still alive. We are killing a lot of shit today. Um, <laughs> these have no feelings. OK, so we're going through. At the end of the oyster, the oyster is connected by the shell. Uh, in this little connector right here, it opens, obviously. You, put the knife at the end of it and just find a little spot and wiggle in. Don't wiggle in too far. And then what you're going to do is just scrape along the top of the oyster and free this top shell from it. Should be clean, right? OK, now the oyster looks like this. And we're going to scoop. You see the abductor muscle right there? You're going to just loosen that just cleanly. You're going to go around, poke your knife around just for any shell matter, and then you're going to turn it over. And that's how an oyster should be presented, right? It's clean, it's pretty, it's not mangled, nobody stabbed it, it's not oozing with white stuff coming through because it was molting. Um, you, you got me right, that is a sexy oyster. <laughs> Whoever whistled them. I did pretty good. Okay, so I'm shucking the oysters with their liquid, um, the liquor in there, discarding the shells. Um, and you can toss the shells in your compost pile. They're, they take like 3,000 years to break down, but they're good for the earth. Okay, we're going to snap more of these, and we're going to have around 20 oysters. I started off a little bit ahead of time with you. It was a little shaky going forward. I did have a 45-minute nap before I got here, so I was friendly. 
Then I rubbed my whole body with CBD oil and got ready to work. I had a small electric scooter accident last week in San Diego. I am okay. San Diego has all these electric scooters you can rent with an app on your phone and whatever by the hour or whatever. And, and they're just randomly at all these places. So you pick them up and we, we'd gone to dinner. I had a couple of drinks, um, like two. It wasn't, wasn't crazy. We got the scooters going to buy all these ca neighborhood cafes. It's beautiful. And some person decided to leave this pile of greasy paper towels on the ascendant point to a sidewalk where the ramp goes on. And I hit it. And right in front of the sidewalk cafe, with, packed with people, <laughs> Atchison just bites the dust. <laughs> like bad, like splayed on the ground. And this one table is like, oh my god, are you OK? And obviously, your natural instinct of the adrenaline's running, and you're like, and you, so I, I hopped up and I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. Grabbed my scooter and whisked off. And the next morning I woke up and I could not move my knee. <laughs> and my leg was like swollen by double, but yeah. So little CBD wipe downs are helping that immensely. <laughs> CBD does not have THC. I'm not stoned right now. But my knee is really fucking relaxed. <laughs> Okay, so we're getting more oysters done. I'm gonna start adding liquids to this in the form of, this is just chicken stock. And then I'm going to also add uh, just some water, which you could add a little bit of wine or vermouth, um, but I'm not one of those chefs who comes up here and just makes you guys margaritas all the time. Those guys are cool. Um, just talking to you, Tim Love, wherever you are. OK, uh, that's coming up to temp. We've got a couple more things to add. I've got some ground ginger, some dry ginger, and that merkin. So the pubic thing goes in. Um, the, the, the ground ginger and uh, the merkin, the smoked chili powder from Chile, and then uh, some chili threads, which are really nice. And um, if you buy chili threads, they're really beautiful. Uh, and they look like this. They're different from the Merkin. Oh, God, where am I going with this? Um, so they're there. If you buy them, you buy a pound, you will have enough for eight lifetimes feeding 65 restaurants. Like, literally, you need like, just a strand of them. I've got some lemon, and I'm going to go through and just um, uh, slice the lemon, and we're going to juice it into it uh, using our hand to keep the seeds away, or this thing. Uh, and then we're going to get our oysters going in. And poaching in the last minute. I just want to taste through to make sure that everything's beginning to come together. We want to be seasoning a little bit with salt and pepper. So salt, remember that oysters are naturally going to have a saline quality because they come from the ocean. So you don't want to over, overdo it, but you want to make sure that things are seasoned. Um, this is going to raise up in sort of richness towards the end when we add uh, some heavy cream and some creme fraiche. I'm going to add some really finely minced garlic. And let me show you how to do that. I want the garlic to be really fresh and not cooked down. So I cut garlic like I do um, onions. So if you can see this, I'm going to kind of take the clove and I'm going to cut it in half. And I'm going to put it on the safe side, which just means the flat side. And I'm going to score it through, but not all the way to the end. A number of times, like, like stairs. Then I'm going to turn it the other way and cut through, not all the way to the end, because I'm just re reserving that little end to hinge everything together. Then I'm going to run through, and I keep my finger touching the knife, and I use a claw. Does that make sense? The reason you use the claw is because it's much better to cut off a bit of your knuckle than the end of your finger. <laughs> this is a uh, very sharp knife. I like very sharp knives. This one is Japanese, and some crazy woman in Charlotte who I catered once for gave it to me. She was like, Michael Jordan used to live in my house. I was like, lady, you're crazy. <laughs> and she was. She and her husband were like 75, and they wanted it like, after all the guests were done, it was my old, my, one of my old chefs, Dean Neff, and I. They just wanted to like party. They were like 75, they just wanted to party until like four o'clock in the morning. I'm like, it's midnight, I'm going to bed. <laughs> um, when we're mincing garlic, you can put a little bit of salt in. 
The salt application on garlic is exactly what salt does in any endeavor. Salt pulls out moisture. That will help to bind it and become more of a pulpy mass that we're looking for. So what I'm doing still is going against it a number of times, and then I'm gonna take the, the side of my knife and kind of work it down in circles. And that really pulps it out to be really fine garlic. So that is a good garlic thing. And if you have kids, make their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches on the same cutting board every day, <laughs> and they will hate you. <laughs> Clementine, my, my youngest, was always, when, when she was like six, she'd be like, why does everything taste like garlic? <laughs> I'd be like, oh, whoops. Um, okay, I've got the cream in there, and then I've got this uh, little bit of creme fraiche. Creme fraiche is just cultured cream that you can make at home really easily. It doesn't like to boil too hard or it can break, so we're gonna reduce the heat down a little bit. So right now this looks like almost a classic style chowder. Um, I've got the parsley going in, a fair bit of that parsley. And I can use, use my little scrapey thing. And then we are going to, oh, I'm killing it. We've got like, 10 minutes left and I've got like half an hour of work to do. Um, I, have, I have get her done tattooed on my bum, so we're gonna be fine. <laughs> I do live in the South. Um, the oysters and their liquor go in. How long do oysters take to poach? Anybody, anybody? Yeah, like a minute, minute or less even. Um, and realize that things will still cook a little bit as they're going out to the table. So final step, I'm gonna add just a little bit of lemon juice, um, using my hand to strain out the gazillion seeds in this lemon. Whoop. Two went in for good luck. Okay, then I've got a ladle. I'm gonna cook up some bread just really quickly. Can I get another skillet? Look at you, we're gonna burn the crap out of some more bread. <laughs> you guys can do this at home, you know that, right? <laughs> My father is a uh, wonderful, wonderful human. Uh, he is a old uh, economist now. Um, but he raised my, me and my three sisters. <laughs> Talk about a guy who did not know anything about parenting. Um, he wor worked a lot, but he like raised my, and my three older sisters. So they were, most of the one, one's like a year older than I am and the rest are like 10 years older. So he had this little toddler boy and these like early teen kids. Um, but he would burn the shit out of some toast. Um, and that's why I, I have a tattoo of burnt toast as an homage to my father, literally. Uh, but the guy is, uh, He's an amazing human. I found the gift of, I found the thing that I'm really good at in life, and he was really supportive through it. But it's this, you know, this, this is a guy who raised us, and he would work till two o'clock in the morning writing economic theories um, and papers and stuff like that. Um, and I do the same thing with reading cookbooks and planning out food and beverage. And so it's, and he, we, he and I talked about it a while back, and we kind of confessed that we both found our, like, are, are endless topics, that in life, if you can find your endless topic that aligns to your career, that happiness is just kind of built into that somehow. And his endless, uh, uh, you know. Uh. And he's a very smart man, very well read. Uh, you know, this was a guy who, uh, over a career in professional sports, because he was drafted in the NHL and the Canadian Football League, he chose to get his PhD at Cambridge. Um, <laughs> But, and, and you know, sometimes being an economist is a little bit boring, so my dad would write uh, long, long books on like the state of the American car industry in Canada and call it like power steering. <laughs> <laughs> it's like his little way of, ooh, I'm nutty and fun. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so we're just doing that bread, then we're gonna do this, I'm gonna pull this big thing out and we're gonna do some crap in a second. Um, and we'll go over that. Um, this is essentially done. I'm just waiting for the bread to burn. Um, <laughs> when we're doing it like this, you can do it in olive oil or butter. Um, and what we're just looking for is nice golden brown to serve it with the stew. I'll do two orders of the stew. 
This stew is so easy. If you live in an area that's got good oysters, you can really do it well. Um, if, so if you live along any coast, eastern coast, western coast, you can find good deals at oysters. Often when you're driving along your coast and finding an oyster farm, buy them direct from them. They'll be fresh. You're going directly to the source, and the price will be a lot less expensive. As soon as oysters go through brokers, they tend to triple in price just like anything else. Um, so this stew is ready, and you'll see it pouring out. So to me, like, everybody's always, like, the stews of the Northeast are great. They really are. This is much more of a Southern style of stew. Um, you could have fresh tomatoes and fennel in the summer. Um, you could add a bunch of peppers if you wanted to. So then I'm just going to serve this with that. And to me, you know, it's not like I eat like a bird, but that and the salad is dinner for me most nights. But it doesn't take that long. You guys, you need to realize I'm never going to come up and do a demonstration of something that I don't think you can do. That's why I have restaurants. Come to Smith Bunny sometime. That's how we pay my mortgage. <laughs> but anybody can do this type of food. And, you know, the connection between how we feel when we cook and when we cook with our kids and we cook with people we love, that connection is totally different from getting takeout food. It's just totally different. I say this every year, but nobody has memories over pizza pockets. <laughs> okay. Oh my God, there's a dick of butter in this pan and I turned it on already. <laughs> Good warning on that one, kitchen crew. Okay. No, uh, this kitchen crew, uh, Bridget gets everything together for us, and I walk in yesterday after flying, and I have to go and check my prep. And every year, the prep is just brilliantly lined up, and Bridget and her crew and Aaron, they always do an amazing, amazing job. So I don't have to worry about it. Okay, so we've got crab. Everybody's scared of crab because they think it's expensive. It's not. It just takes a while. And the amount of flesh that you get out of it is a lot of work for a lot of little bit of crab, unless you go the king crab route, and those things are insane. <laughs> but go eat king crab in Juneau, Alaska, this little roadside stand downtown. I forget, it's a woman's name, and it's so good. Um, and the crab's like steamed right in front of you and just served with drawn butter and spice and whatever, and it's great. Okay, um, I've got, in this instance, I've got a lot of herbs. I've got shallot. I've got chopped Calabrian chilies, which are chilies from Calabria. Um, hence, yeah, okay, yeah. Um, which are a beautiful spicy chili uh, that are fermented chilies. And you're telling me 10 minutes. I got you. Okay, now we're going to, I've got some, that's the same wine. This is Guilibo Plaisance, which means guile bought pleasure. I was just in France. <laughs> Didn't want to have to spring that on you guys. Um, okay, I've got miso. Miso's wonderful in an application like this. And um, I'm going to cite my recipe because I forget what the hell he did. Ah, there. This is where the butter comes in. We're using a lot of it. And the heat's really hot, so we're going to work fast. Okay, so to reduce the heat on the pan, stir the butter around a lot and dump half of it on your knee. Not the knee you have injured. <laughs> then we're going to put in the Calabrian chilies and make this place smell really spicy and good. Then we're going to add some miso. And we're going to add our white wine to it. And the white wine will break down that miso. Also, I've got, so the miso just needs to be broken down into this. This is my white wine. I'm going to cook those shallots out just a little bit. Make sure they smell good. Those Calabrian chilies just smell so badass when they hit, hit the heat. It's like that fermented loveliness. This is one messy, simple plate of food, but it's really fast because usually when you buy crab, you're buying steamed crab already. You could cook raw crab. You could do this with Dungeness and get, but usually even with Dungeness, you're buying it cooked already. So the wine went in. I'm gonna bring up that heat. Everything's in the pan right now, except for a lot of herbs. So in this case, I've got leaves of basil, which is Walt Whitman's follow-up to leaves of grass. 
Um, and I've got fresh mint. I think fresh mint is so underrated and you can grow it anywhere, um, pretty much in the United States. With abundance, it's really easy to grow. Um, literally, where I live, if you can't grow uh, fresh mint, you should buy a condo. Because <laughs> it's so easy. Like, it's a, we it's a perennial weed. Okay, the uh, crabs are going in. They're already cooked, so we're just trying to glaze them out. All this beautiful herbage is going to go in. Get a top shot of that. Where can they see it? Yes, you can see it. <laughs> Practicing my librarian voice. Okay, so we're going to do this and just get all that flavor in and heat those crabs in there, and then we're going to eat them. So that is really it. So again, let's go, let's go back to why I write books and why I do what I do and how proud I am to see people cooking from scratch more and more. You cannot, it, I, okay, so I taught my kids a lot about food. They're better kids for it, period, right? I started this foundation that's now four years old and or three years old, it was very successful, called seedlifeskills.org which replaced home ec curriculum in public schools in our district with a whole new curriculum based around kids roasting a chicken and poaching an egg and making a salad dressing. Not precious food, accessible, good food that people can eat every day and make faster than they can go to Chick-fil-A and stand in line. If we don't, this, this is a non-political, food and food security should be non-political. The food security that I'm talking about is making sure everybody has a basic set of skills to be able to nourish themselves and those around them in a quick and efficient manner. And that means buying fresh food, not processed food. And it's, it, it's by learning in school how to do those core value things when it comes to food. Food should be like a Lego set. I just have more pieces than you. But each piece should be a technique or a skill set that then you can build into different things and take your mind out of the recipe and realize that it's so easy to create new flavors with what's at hand with other skill sets that you know. If you've got a ton of arugula and you have a basil pesto recipe, if you're not making arugula pesto, you're missing the boat. That is a technique that you can apply to something different. So all of these notions need to come together for every American to put food on their table in an efficient and economically viable way. But we only teach them that by teaching them skill sets. But if you teach a kid how to poach an egg and make a vinaigrette, it's like riding a bike. You will never forget it. Not like riding a scooter. <laughs> that is much more difficult. Um, OK, let's platter these up. I got a platter right here. Look at that. OK, so this is meant to be like get the newspaper down type of food on the table because it's going to be a mess. I would say this would feed two. <laughs> that looks so fucking good. <laughs> like if I went to a restaurant right now and got that in a really cold bottle of white wine, I'd be like, oh, good. I'm going to rub myself down with that oil and go to bed. <laughs> Guys, I have five minutes. That's the crab. Any questions? You can ask questions about anything. OK. Uh, I don't know. You know what? Let's do it this way. I will repeat the question back so everybody hears it. Yes. Yeah, definitely. So she said the new thing is fennel pollen. We've got um, Miss Popcorn of Food Forecasting over here. Um, <laughs> The new thing is fennel pollen, people, um, which, which is an amazing ingredient. And it's um, like, uh, yeah, hand harvested by small Malaysian one-armed men somewhere or something like that. <laughs> it's very precious and very expensive. Um, it's good. It's, it's, it's assertive. It's, it's got a really beautiful fennel, fennel flavor. Yeah, you could definitely add it to that. You could add toasted fennel seed, crush down a little bit, and mortar and pestle. And just think about different overtones that you want to it. You could even go in a different direction and add like um, a little bit of clove or mace. Mace is really popular in sort of West African uh, seafood dishes, and that would work really well in that regard too. Uh, yes? If we can't find the vegetables. Sausage? You could use potato. You could use really whatever you want. I'm not in your kitchen, or that one time, but you weren't home. <laughs> Straight back there. Do you 
Do I think there's a lot of big difference between there are bigger sous vide contraptions now that are kind of, it's built in as a pot that you plug in. It's kind of like a really fancy slow cooker uh, versus one of these, which is just, this is, this is one of those ones that you just attach to a pot. And we're just, this is technically called a Lexan. Um, and it's just good, you can order them on a Amazon. I don't think there's that much of a difference. There are difference in qualities of the different sous vide uh, production of these things. Some of them are not very well made and some are. The best you can buy is made by probably, I don't know, PolyScience. Do you guys make one now? No, no. Um, PolyScience makes one, uh, which is now owned by Breville, but yeah, whatever. Um, so, but pick whatever one you want. Um, there are a number of them in the sort of two to three hundred dollar category right now. At the rate that you'll probably use it at home, most of them will keep up, unless you decide to do a pop up restaurant in your house. <laughs> Don't do that. It is not not as cool as everyone says. Um, okay, I can barely see you because of a very bright light above my head. Uh, standing up and waving. Yes. When you say immobilize, is that to kill? <laughs> she said, have you ever used the lobster after you've immobilized it um, and uh, done it on the grill that way? Yeah, you could definitely do it on a grill that way. That'd be great. Um, and just, just brush it a lot with like, melted butter and lemon and some spices and stuff like that as it's cooking. I would cut the bottom part of the tail open to really kind of get some of that brushing going into it as it's grilling. Um, and make sure you skewer it to keep it straight. But you can even keep it whole with the head on and stuff like that. Um, and I don't know if you're a Navy SEAL, but it, if you immobilize it, that's <laughs> fine. She has removed the lobster threat from the facility. <laughs> we are clear. Yes, you in the back, sir. Can you add the what? Can we add the garlic Yeah, I forgot. Move on. <laughs> He's a elite yelper. Yes, sir. Stand up. Oh, you can just cook it. I mean, you could definitely cook it just in boiling water. Six minutes a pound. So if those are pound and a quarter, you're going to do eight minutes. Rapidly boiling water with some other spice in it. I like to put Old Bay and lemon and salt in there to fully uh, flavor it. Because I gained a lot of flavor by cooking the, the stuff in the sous vide bath, like we did, because I added the tarragon and butter. And who doesn't like that as a cooking medium? Um, so. But yeah, you could do it completely and then pull it out, cool it, and process it that way. It will be fully cooked and ready to use that way. Does that make sense? Killing this question and answer thing. <laughs> yes, at the end. Uh, they're fed to charity. <laughs> Next. Yes. Literally, my dad would work till eight, come home from the university, and like, um, I mean, we ate fish sticks and burnt rice and can canned yellow wax beans, which I still have a fondness for, amazingly. Um, no, I mean, we, we definitely ate well. Um, my, my father remarried after a while to a woman who was very ambitious and liked to make us really disgustingly fatty veal asabuco. She was an uh, inspired cook, but not a very good one. Um, so, you know, but my, my, my culinary memories of growing up with my dad are going to the Port Portuguese grocery store on the corner uh, near our house and buying beautiful loaves of Portuguese bread. And my dad's a big avid fan of just bread and or like simple orange, like just really good oranges. My dad was born in Cuba before the revolution and he's got a love of some really simple things in life. So, and he and I would walk up and grab a big steak and he wouldn't screw that up. So, yeah. Okay, anybody else? I do cook Cuban food. Uh, current Cuban food or historical Cuban food? Either. Cuba doesn't have any fucking food. Um, <laughs> it is the most lovely culture of the most resilient, amazing people, but the resources down there are just abysmal. Um, going there and eating is like the, the last thing on your mind. But go, Havana is unbelievably interesting. Um, sorry, somebody, yes? How old were your girls when you started cooking again? <laughs> 
Uh, my girls are now 13 and 15. Or no, they just have birthdays. They're 14 and 16. Oof. Uh, but they're great. Like, the 16-year-old's like my adult best friend. She's like totally mellow and cool. Um, and they're awesome. They're totally like amazing. I don't, they're, they're mine. They both have one eyebrow, but <laughs> they're so much smarter than me. And they're girls, so they pluck. Um, <laughs> Beatrice, the oldest one, uh, spent the first year of her life in a baby Bjorn as I cooked. So she would face out. <laughs> and I would be making all the sauces and all the gnocchi. And at my first restaurant, I mean, I did everything. I mean, the books clean the toilets, answer the phone. And I still have that restaurant. I'm just not there as much, uh, which is called Five and Ten in Athens. And Beatrice would come, and her mom would come pick her up around one. But from nine until one, she'd cook with me getting things going. She, so she'd have like flour and stuff on her toes and like splatters of little bits of sauce and like little pieces of meat butchery. <laughs> uh, and, but it was great. So, but yeah, it's amazing how humans learn, and she learned something. And it's amazing that at the age of five, she was ready to go after kindergarten, and I could hear her in the kitchen. She was all dressed up, and I wasn't even out of bed yet, but I could peer out and see. And she was making all this ruckus, and she was making um, a salad, but she was making a vinaigrette off to the side. She was shaking in a jar, three parts oil to one part acid, and she knew the ratio and was making that to pack it up to go with her lunch. So obviously I came out bawling, you know, God, it was that. Um, and now I have to buy her a car. Oh, God. They grow up. Um, I think I'm going to round this up. You guys have been awesome. I'm going to sign cookbooks later on. Uh, go have fun out there. Enjoy. <laughs>